Okay, so thank you, Tami. Thank you for inviting me. And it's really great to, uh, to be here and, and talk to you about our uh, uh, research. So what I'm going to talk about today is an idea that we had, which uh, uh, happily um, really became a reality, which is to use ideas inspired by the renormalization group uh, using in combination with um, uh, machine learning and neural networks in order to calculate uh, topological invariance. So my collaborators on this are uh, uh, Yuval, who is my advisor, Tami, uh, who you all know, and Gilad, who is uh, also a PhD student with, uh, with Yuval. All right, so let me start by briefly describing the, the big picture and sort of um, the problem that we're trying to, to face, which is uh, how to calculate topological invariance. Now, this is, I'm not going to give a very lengthy introduction to topology and all of that, but I guess you've all heard about the concepts of Berry curvature and Berry connection, Berry phase, chair numbers, and so on. But these all depend on the existence of a Brillouin zone. So if you have a clean system, then the prescription is very straightforward. Depending on the symmetry class, dimension, and so on, so there are some details going on, but you basically have to go to your uh, Brillouin zone and calculate some local properties, some very um, connection, and then you integrate over them, right? And that would give you an integer. With, and for different topological systems, this integer can be, you know, it can be zero or one, it can be uh, any integer number, but it's quantized. Now, the problem begins when we have disordered systems, because in disordered systems, there is no notion of a Brillouin zone, there is no K space, so we have to use uh, real space algorithms. And I've listed a few examples here, which are specific to uh, two dimensions, which is what the focus of this talk is going to be. Uh, but let me just uh, motivate. So uh, in principle, you could say, if we don't have a Brillouin zone, then maybe we don't even have a meaning for the topological invariant, right? But, but clearly, if we think of the limit of weak disorder, which we're you know, just slightly perturbing the uh, clean system, we should still have uh, the notion of a, a topological invariant well-defined. Um, and it's not gonna change unless our disorder is so strong so as to, uh, to close the gap. So there is a notion of a topological invariant. The question is just how to calculate it. And it turns out to be a very challenging task. In fact, what you have to do is you have to use real space algorithms, which take into account, which kind of try to uh, do the inverse Fourier transform in a way. And that requires you to actually fully diagonalize the Hamiltonian. So if we have uh, a 2D system with linear dimension L, then you have to diagonalize an L square by L square uh, matrix, which is a very uh, inefficient um, thing to do, which means you cannot really use it on very large lattices. Now, our approach, which is um, the focus of this talk is gonna be explaining how, how this magic happens, but our approach is to use something like an RG. Uh, because, you know, in RG, you usually take a, 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 a large problem and you somehow transform it into a small problem, which is easier to solve while preserving some property of interest, which for our case is going to be uh, the chair number, which is a specific kind of topological invariant that we're going to be interested in. And because I don't want you to be in suspense, here is the end result right now. So you can see here that the uh, runtime of the calculation versus the linear dimension of the system. In blue, you see the standard method, the best method that we are aware of. And it scales, you know, kind of with this large power law of the system size. And our approach in orange, the neural network is, is actually sublinear. So it's extremely fast compared to the uh, standard method. Um, both in absolute terms, but most importantly, in the way it scales. So the first thing I wanna do, and it's gonna be kind of brief, uh, is, is give you a quick introduction to machine learning 
and what this whole story is about. So uh, what's what is machine learning? It's basically a different kind of approach to solve uh, computer related problems. Instead of you know looking at the problem, looking for some algorithm to solve the problem, which is the way it's been done for many, many decades, you actually teach the computer uh, how to solve the problem by giving it examples or reinforcement for uh, doing well. So this is kind of inspired by the way our brain is, is uh, believed to work in, in the sense that, you know, how do you guys know how to recognize a cat or a dog? It's not like somebody came and explained to you, you know, a cat has these properties and the dog has other properties. It's basically because you have seen many, many cats and dogs and you've learned how to classify them in your brain. So the idea is to make machine learning, uh, to make the computer actually do uh, the same thing or a similar thing. And when something becomes so much hyped, like machine learning, you know, in, in recent years, it's been very hard to, uh, to not come by this term, then you have to ask usually two questions. The first is, what is it? Which I'm gonna quickly explain. But the second question is why now? So why, why is everyone talking about machine learning now and not you know, decades ago? And the reason it's become so popular is, is twofold. First of all, um, the algorithms which make this possible to, to actually happen have, have greatly evolved. I'm gonna describe very briefly one of the major uh, breakthroughs. And secondly, it's been realized that existing hardware, and it, in particular, what's called the GPUs or graphical processing units, uh, can be used to greatly, greatly accelerate uh, the runtime and training time of machine learning algorithms. Uh, but this is not you know, a quantitative difference. It really made it from impossible to possible. And today, today you can, I mean, everything I'm gonna show you uh, today was, was done with our, um, uh, desktops, like at the uh, at the Weizmann Institute, it does not require any supercomputers, anything like that. So it's really amazing how everything has be has become so uh, accessible. And um, you know, the reason that people are so excited about machine learning is that it's really able to perform extremely well on complicated problems. So here is one example, which is called the MNIST. It's a collection of uh, millions of handwritten digits written by uh, human beings. And the task is to identify them. And of course, you guys can easily do it. It's like nine, two, one, and so on. Uh, for, for standard computer algorithms, this is a very challenging task. And in fact, the best algorithm uh, known to date to, uh, to, do, to tackle this problem is, an, is a, a machine learning algorithm. It's a, a so-called convolutional uh, neural network, and it's able to reach human-like um, human -like precision. Now, another example, which you, you probably, if you open your phone, this is a screenshot from my phone, and you look at your pictures, your, uh, your photos, you see it kind of knows, you know, automatically that this is a desert, animal, lake, and so on. So it, you know, it categorizes your images uh, automatically, and you would think, you know, the the smart engineers at Apple or Google or Samsung or whatever, uh, like sat down and wrote, you know, taught the algorithm how to recognize the sky and you know uh, uh, trees and so on. But that's not really what happened. What happened was they fed the the algorithm with many many examples of deserts and animals and lakes and so on, and the thing learned uh, by itself how to do it. Now, the final example um, is, is facial recognition. So it's pretty amazing. You can actually take pictures uh, of, of, norm, you know, of people today and, and uh, put them into a machine learning algorithm, which, de which then does what we call feature extraction. So it realizes where the mouth and nose and eyes are. And then, you know, and that becomes, that's like the, uh, the almost scary part of it you can rearrange them, you can move around the, uh, the nose and the eyes and so on, and you can make a different face, which is very similar to the first one. So this is, this is where you start getting into these moral questions about the deep fake and so on. 
uh, not the focus of this talk, but the point is that machine learning can really do uh, pretty amazing stuff, which were computationally unachievable before. Um, so how does it all happen? The basic building block is what we call a perceptron or uh, a neuron, which is you know in analogy to uh, to an actual to an actual neuron in the brain. Uh, the perceptron is just you know to make to make it clear that this is not an a biological neuron; it's just an artificial one. This is a very simple unit. It takes some inputs x1, x2, and so on, and it calculates some weighted sum, some some wj dot xj, uh, where w are are weights, and it compares these weights to a threshold which we call b. Now if if this weighted sum is greater than a threshold, then the output is one. And if it's lower, the output is zero. This is a step function uh, activation. And this is, this is very much in analogy to the way biological neurons work. You know, they have some inputs, some, some uh, triggers. And when they reach some threshold, then the neuron fires, you know, it fires so one. Um, in reality, this is not, this is usually not taken to be this strict um, step function. It's rather a bit uh, smeared, but this is the basic idea. Now, this unit by itself is not particularly powerful. You, you see, it can only do um, kind of binary stuff. It can just take simple functions. It can only perform uh, simple functions. But when you put uh, many of these in a network, so each one of these is a perceptron, then you can get a lot of computational power and complexity. So this is the basic structure of what we call a feed-forward neural network. So you start here with, with an input. This input can be some vector. It could be you know, your, your uh, digits from before, where each, each point here is a pixel. It can be one or zero, you know, white or black. And you have an output which could say, you know, if it's one, two, three, four, you know, what, what digit is it? And then in between, you have all of these connections, which go by the mysterious name of a hidden layer, but they're just hidden because you don't access them. You only access the output. And here we just have neurons. Each one of these takes in the inputs. It has some weights. It has its own bias, and it calculates this, this nonlinear function. It's weighted sums and then step function or any other nonlinear function. Um, and the point is that by combining all of these, um, all of these uh, many, many neurons together, you can actually calculate very complicated functions. And you can actually prove uh, rigorously that if you have uh, a large enough neural network, you can actually uh, simulate any general function of the inputs no matter how complicated it is, uh, which is very powerful. I mean, the the, the core the core of the uh, of the power lies in the fact that we have some nonlinearity uh, in each of these. If we only had these weighted sums, and you know, it would just be a linear transformation, then you would have been limited to only linear functions of the inputs. But the fact that you have nonlinearity really lets you do uh, so much more than that. So what is the learning in machine learning? Uh, I'm going to quickly describe, describe what's called supervised learning. So in supervised learning, what you do is you actually give, uh, give the, the network uh, a set of examples. The examples are vectors. They're input vectors. And each one of them comes with a label, you know, one, two, three, four, and so on. If it's a digit or, you know, cat or dog, whatever you are trying to, uh, to classify. And the process of learning is really the process of changing the weights and, and bias at each one of the neurons along the way. So you have many, many neurons and you have to update and each one of them carries a vector of weights and a scalar, which is the bias. And you have to update each and every one in a systematic uh, way. Now, the way it's done is that you define some cost function, which is basically the difference between the desired output and the calculated output. 
usually people use stuff like the Euclidean distance or you know the uh, absolute difference, but any of these can work and depending on the type of problem, many of them can do better than others. And then what you do is you, you start here at the end and let's say that your digit is nine, but you really got eight. Then you change the weights and bias of this final, uh, final layer of, uh, of neurons according to the gradient of the cost function. You are trying to minimize the cost function to bring it as close as possible to zero. So uh, if you know the activation function, which is this generalization of the step function, you can tell by the gradient of it how the weights and bias should be uh, updated at, for each and every example. And then you, know, you start, you do it at this layer, and then you just go back one layer, you propagate back to the previous layer, you propagate the error from this layer to that layer, and then you can actually update the weights and biases of this layer and so on. So if you have many, many networks in what we call a deep neural network, then you would start at the end, update the weights, and then go back and back and back until you reach the input. And uh, this is what we call back propagation because you start at the end and you go back. And the realization that you can actually use um, gradient, gradient descent in a very efficient way to do that is one of the major breakthroughs of the last, uh, I would say, decade or maybe decade and a half that made it possible to, uh, to train large scale neural networks to do actual, you know, interesting tasks. And you can actually almost see from this uh, cartoon picture why this is very uh, uh, easy to generalize using many uh, computational cores. Let's say that you have uh, a GPU with, with many, many cores. Each of these cores is very weak, but you have many of them. So you can update the weights and bias of each neuron in a layer independently of the others, right? The, the updating of this one does not depend on this one or that one, which is why you can do it in a massively parallel way. So this is why you can actually use very weak units, but many, many of them, and you can get very impressive, uh, impressive results. Now I should say right here before we get to the physics that this is all the very nice and and uh, promising and impressive and I've shown you examples of you know how it outperforms every other known algorithm but there is a problem the problem is that once you have trained your network it does very well but you don't really know how it's doing it like what's going on in there it's like a black box that you've trained and you don't know uh, the inner workings of the network. So this is always a caveat with machine learning. Uh, hopefully, if I have time during the end of the talk today, I will, so, I will show you something about how we can get some insight into what our network will do. But you should keep in mind that this is, this is a, an open question. How does it work? All right, so, so far I've described like a basic introduction to machine learning and let's go on to uh, the physics. If you have any questions about uh, this brief crash course in machine learning, this would be a good time. Uh, otherwise, you can always stop me in the middle. So uh, as I said, when I started the talk, we there, this whole thing of topological condensed matter physics has become very sort of important and popular in recent years because we've understood that many phenomena are really described by topological stuff, you know, topological invariance, topological uh, charges, and so on. So what we wanted to do is, is use this machine learning approach to study one of these problems. And the model that we chose is what's called a P plus IP superconductor. So this model uh, on a lattice takes the following form. It's just, uh, you have at each site, it's, it's just a, a square lattice of spinless fermions described by these creation violation operators, uh, C dagger and C. And at each site you have a chemical potential mu, and you also have some tunneling amplitudes to the left and uh, to the right and down, which are Tx and Ty 
they can in general be, diff be different than one another. And you also have superconducting pairings. So these are pair creation and pair annihilation operators, uh, which also act between uh, nearest neighbors, right? You, many times we are used to thinking about uh, superconducting terms which are local, but here we don't have spin. So the lowest order thing that we can write is actually um, nearest neighbor superconducting pairing. Now, um, what's interesting about this model? It turns out this is maybe the simplest model describing uh, a two-dimensional topological superconductor. And in certain regimes of the parameters, which I will get to in a moment, this system has a non-trivial uh, topological invariant. And that means that it has a chiral Majorana edge mode. So this is kind of the analog of the uh, integer quantum Hall effect, but instead of having a uh, just a chiral fermion, you have a chiral Majorana fermion, which is in a way half of a, of a normal fermion. It only has half the degrees of freedom. So that's why uh, we're interested in this sort of uh, model. And you can see that right now I've written uh, this mu, t, and, and delta to be site dependent, right? So, so in each site they can take on uh, different values. But we start, of course, with the clean case. In the clean case, all the mu's are the same, all the t's are the same. And we can just use all these tricks that I alluded to in the beginning of looking at the, um, at the Brillo and zone and so on. And we can actually just find uh, the phase diagram. And this is what the phase diagram looks like. So uh, what are the parameters? We set delta to be, uh, if it turns out that in the clean case, delta does not really affect the phase diagram, only the sign of delta matters. So this is for positive delta. And if you switch delta, and the numbers just change sign, but the uh, active parameters are the chemical potential and the uh, the hopping, and what it's it's uh, convenient to define this t plus and minus, which are t x plus or minus t y over two, and we're setting t plus the sum of the um, hopping amplitudes to be one, so that just fixes your energy scale. And then we are studying the system as a function of the chemical potential and T minus, which is the sort of, you know, the hopping and isotropy. So it, at this point, everything is isotropic. Now, what we find here is that, first of all, you know, that the, the uh, topological invariant of interest is a Cher number, which is what is exactly the same kind of, of topological invariant that you find in the quantum Hall effect. Um, and it takes on the values zero, which is trivial, and plus or minus one, where plus or minus one correspond to phases that have uh, chiral Majorana edge modes. So this plus or minus one would determine if the chirality is you know, clockwise or counterclockwise. So, so far that's the clean case and it's been known for quite a long time, but what happens when we have disorder? So now again, mu and t minus and delta, they all become site dependent. And that means that we, again, have to use some real space algorithm in order to find out what the topological invariants are. And then the phase diagrams become realization dependent. So I'm sorry, I forgot the axis here. So with the same axis, mu and t minus, but now mu, this is the average mu, and this is the average t minus. And on top of that, you have this order everywhere. So obviously for each realization of this order, your phase diagram would look a little bit different. So it's still, it always still looks like these uh, triangles, but here you see that there are these deviations from, uh, from the clean case. And of course the areas most susceptible to this order are the ones close to the phase boundaries, right? At the, where you're near the phase boundary, then the gap is small and then this order can play a, a significant role. So this is the problem that we want to, to deal with, how to, to find the uh, uh, phase diagram of the disordered uh, P plus IP superconductor using a neural network. So of course, the first thing we have to think about is why to even use a neural network. So the main motivation, which I've 
started with is that the bot algorithm, which is the best known algorithm to, uh, to do this kind of stuff in real space, it scales very badly with the linear lattice size to the, to the extent that you cannot really use it uh, you know, systematically for systems larger than, let's say, 100 by 100 sites. That would become too hard uh, even for very strong computers. Um, now, this, this uh, task of finding the Chern number, you know, minus one, zero, or one, is very suitable for machine learning, right? Because we all know that machine learning is very good at telling whether a picture is a cat or a bird or, or a dog. It's kind of the same. You give it some input, which I will describe in a moment, and it just tells you minus one, zero, or one. This is what we call a classification task. And there is a very well-developed body of literature and code, which is already there, uh, which is suitable for, for this kind of task. Uh, and finally, the, the core of this work will be that the, the use of machine learning will enable us to, to uh, use the ideas of, of uh, RG in order to, uh, to take a large system into a small one. Okay, so let's start with what kind of input we are giving our network. So like I said, we fix T plus, the Tx plus Ty to be one in all sites, and that just fixes the energy scale. And then what we have is at each site, we have to specify what is mu, what is the uh, T minus, and what is delta, the, the superconducting pairing. So that means that we have for a lattice of size L, we have L times L times three parameters. And you can really think of these like uh, RGB of, uh, of an image, right? So at each, at each uh, point, at each pixel, if you want, you have three channels, which are you know, red, green, and blue. And for us, they are uh, delta, T minus, and mu. So this is the, the input structure. And then the first step is to, to take uh, a neural network and teach it how to calculate the Chern numbers of a relatively small system, a four by four lattice. So for this, we generated 10 to the nine uh, training samples. And when I say training sample, I mean a specific disorder configuration. You know, at each site, we randomize uh, uh, the values of mu and T minus and delta. And we use the known algorithm, the one that scales very badly, to calculate the, the corresponding chair number of each sample. So we have the uh, uh, data and labels. So minus one, zero, and one. Now we feed these into uh, a neural network, which happens to have nine layers. Um, I'm not really going to uh, discuss the architecture too much unless uh, I see that you're interested in it. But what I wanted to, uh, to show is that the number of trainable parameters or, or parameters that, that are varied along the way is, is massive. It's in the millions. Uh, and and this, this network is supposed to calculate the churn number. All right, so this is the first step and let's see how well it does. So here are the three examples I showed you before. These are calculated directly by the standard method. And this is the uh, output, the corresponding output from our neural network. So you can see it's very hard to tell the difference. This network has an accuracy of over 99.9%. Uh, you can see there are slight misses, you know, like this little puddle here, which is missed, or, you know, slightly smaller here. But overall, this, this is um, very high accuracy for this so-called base network. All right. And now, the main, the main uh, step comes now. So we have a network, which is, you know, which is a good network, which, which gives you the chair number of a four by four disordered system. But what we want now is to use an RG-like approach to uh, use, to take a larger system into uh, a four by four thing. So, just a quick reminder for how RG usually works. You have a large problem, which is hard to solve, and you're mapping it into a small problem, which is 
easier to solve. Now, usually when you do real space RG, maybe you're interested in preserving the low lying energies, you know, the ground state energy and so on. And here, what we want is to uh, preserve the property which interests us, which is the chair number. So our large system for this stage is going to be an eight by eight lattice. And the small system is a four by four lattice, right? Because if we have a system which has this size, we already know what to do. We just push it into the, uh, the network that we already trained, and then we get the chair number. So this block, this so-called RG or resizing network is the main focus of our work. So how do we find an, uh, this transformation, which takes us from eight by eight to four by four in a way that preserves the Chur number? So if we, had, if we had this network, then this would be the overall structure of getting a, uh, the Chur number from, an, from a four by four. So you would take your four by four, you would put it into this machine that that transforms four by, uh, sorry, eight by eight into four by four. And then the four by four will be input into the base network that we already trained before, and you will get your chair number. So to tell you about how we uh, can train this block, this, this RG block, I have to quickly explain what a convolutional neural network is. So this is, the structure here is a little bit different from what I showed you before where all the inputs were connected to all the neurons in the next layer. So here, what we do is we take this so-called kernel, which is a little block, little, uh, a little square, which runs along the, uh, the lattice or the image. And every pixel in this, uh, which for us is a site, every pixel here is connected to a neuron, right? So we don't connect everything to, the, to this neuron, we only connect these spatially neighboring sites into this neuron. So you start doing it here at the corner, and then this gives, this gives you one neuron in the first hidden layer. And then you simply move, you move this, uh, this kernel, let's say one pixel to the right, okay? So that would give you the next, the next neuron. And, and this way, this is how it continues. Of course, you don't have to, all, to only move it by one. You can move it by more. This is called the stride. Um, and the shape, I mean, the size of this kernel is also a free parameter. So it determines, you know, how far away you want your correlations to, uh, to persist. And basically what you do is you repeat this many, many times. So this would be, you know, the first convolutional layer, and then you have another one. And the important thing is that this current, these weights and biases are the same, right? They are the same along each of these neurons. And then you simply take many, many copies of that. Okay, so you start from your image and you transform it into a set of smaller images. So this is exactly, this is, this is the way, uh, the way state-of-the-art algorithms uh, are used in order to, to do uh, image classification and image processing. And it happens to be exactly what we want to do with our system, right? Because the entire goal here is to take a larger image, if you want, and transform it into a smaller image. The thing is that we also want to preserve some property. So we have a, we have uh, a constraint which is not usually uh, present in, in this kind of algorithms. So how does the training look like? We have, uh, we also have to generate many samples of eight by eight lattices. So again, we use the known algorithm, the, the known and slow algorithm to calculate the chair numbers of many, many disorder configurations of eight by eight lattices. And then we feed them into the network. Now, we have this convolutional network here, which I just described, the RG network, and this one is being trained. But importantly, the base network, the one that I showed you before, which takes four by four to a chair number, this one is held frozen. We don't touch it at all uh, during the training process, okay? 
So this way, we are only training this block. You know, we are telling it it should take uh, eight by eight to four by four. And what is the cost function? So we have a chair number here, and we have a chair number here, and we are training this uh, this network to minimize the difference between the two. Right, so even though there is another step here, which is the base network, this step does not take part in training. Only he, only this one, uh, is being trained. And now this, uh, if you do that on on this eight by eight lattices, you would get again a very high accuracy. So a little bit less than what you would get from the base network, but that's to be expected. But still, very very high accuracy for eight by eight. And now the question is really, how can you generalize it? How can you take um, how can you take even larger lattices into uh, into account in this network? And actually, if you look, let me go a little bit back to to make this point clear. So if you look at this structure of a convolutional network, really it doesn't care about the shape, the the, the input size, right? This kind of 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 network will take any n by n image or lattice into an n over two by n over two lattice. So if you give it eight by eight, it will make you a four by four. And if you give it 16 by 16, it will spit out uh, eight by eight. So out of the box, you can just use this, just plug and play uh, using larger lattices, which is what I, uh, which is what I'm picturing here. So you're just using the exact same RG network. There is no further training at this uh, stage. And you are uh, just you know, concatenating it, putting it one uh, once and then once again. So you start from 16 by 16, you go to eight by eight, then you go to four by four, and then you have your base network, which gives the chair number. So when you do that, you get, this terrible accuracy of 72 point something percent, which is, it's worse than guessing. So this is very, very bad. So at this point, we're kind of disappointed. We're, uh, we're thinking, you know, what went wrong? What, what did we do wrong? Um, and the, the point really is that nobody told the network it should be able to also work for large lattices. So, you know, technically, it works, you know, if you plug it in, it gives you, it doesn't throw an error, it gives you something. But nobody told it it should be good at it, right? So it, it only saw, it only ever saw eight by eight lattices, never saw 16 by 16 or, you know, even larger. And, and what it does is naturally it chooses a solution which is tailor-made to work for eight by eight. You know, maybe there is also a solution which works for any scale, but why should it pick this particular one instead of all the very, you know, non-generalizable overfitting solutions? So we have to give it a push in the right direction. And the way we do it is by the initialization. So usually neural networks, you know, what are the parameters? Again, there are these uh, weights and biases. And you have to initialize them somehow. So usually people just put, you know, maybe a Gaussian distribution or uniform, anything which is just random. And we're doing a different thing. We're actually initializing the network to do sort of the zero order approximation of this RG transformation we want it to learn. And that is decimation. So you simply take every four sites uh, in this way, and you simply average, you know, average the mu and the t minus and the delta, and you just have a four by four. Now, this of course will not have very good um, uh, performance. It will not give you the chair number in a very high accuracy. But one thing you cannot take away from it: it is infinitely generalizable. You can you can apply it to any lattice size. And it will always just take blocks of four sites into one site. So it will always take you from n by n to n over two by n over two with this simple averaging. And now if you, if you take this as your starting point and then you start training for the chair number, 
then hopefully uh, it will it will not become non generalizable so fast. So how does this work? Uh, this is the training time, so how long the network has been training, and here you can see the accuracy. So for eight by eight, the accuracy, uh, you know, it it increases kind of monotonically. Not exactly. It's like you know, the stock market's never really uh, monotonous, but it's kind of uh, kind of steadily increasing. Now the same network without further training is also tested on 16 by 16. And the behavior you can see is, is actually very non-monotonous. So even if you even if you ignore these large fluctuations, you can see that the structure is the accuracy increases more or less up to this point and then it starts decreasing. So what's happening here? Up to this stage, the network, uh, the network, sorry, the network started here at you know just simple averaging, simple decimation, right? So this gave us about 92 or 93 uh, percent accuracy for the different lattice sizes. Now you start training it for chair number. So of course the six, the eight by eight becomes better, but interestingly the 16 by 16 also becomes better which implies that at this stage, the network is still doing uh, something which is generalizable. It's not going too far away from the generalizable uh, limit. So you can think about it you know, as like a, a Taylor approximation. So the decimation is the zeroth order. And then here you are adding slight corrections um, to this approximation and you don't want them to, to, to jeopardize your uh, generalizability. But eventually the network uh, improves on eight by eight, but becomes worse on 16 by 16, because eventually it does run away from being generalizable. And it finds again, this very specific solution, which is good for eight by eight. So if you stop it here at the correct point, you will actually get pretty high accuracy for both eight by eight and four by four, sorry, for both eight by eight and 16 by 16. Um, and this figure, this 95.6 this, uh, is of course a bit less than the one for, uh, for eight by eight, but it is significantly faster than any known algorithm. And uh, it is significantly better than just, you know, just doing averaging or just ignoring the disorder. So this right here is the, the main uh, and maybe surprising result. So the neural network was able to learn how to operate on, on uh, large lattices, which it was never trained on. It was never trained on 16 by 16. All right, so I think we have a couple more minutes left, right? So I will, uh, I will briefly describe how we actually tackle this problem of uh, you know, opening the black box or trying to understand what the RG network is really doing. And uh, for this, I wanna actually take you back uh, a couple of slides. So you know, here we have maybe even one more. So here we have uh, a two-stage structure. So we have our input and then one neural network, which does a resizing, and then another neural network. And what I want to do now is I want to focus on this RG block without even asking about the chair number. So the chair number, I know it was trained on and I know it's giving me very good accuracy. So I'm forgetting about it. And I'm just asking, what is this network doing to my parameter space? How does it act in parameter space? So um, let's look at it this way. Let's, let's take... Uh, a collection of clean systems. So clean eight by eight lattices. And each one of them is characterized by uh, the, sch the chemical potential and the T minus. All right, so we're just taking them to be a uniform grid in this parameter space. Okay, so they're evenly spaced points. And now what we're going to do is we're feeding each of these uh, points into the neural network. And we're asking where does each point flow in parameter space. So the movie you're gonna see now is the evolution of the points as the training uh, progresses. 
Okay, so I hope you can see the animation properly. So you can see that the points uh, are no longer uniformly distributed in space. So most importantly, uh, you can see these black lines are the phase boundaries in the clean case, okay? And the points kind of run away. They run away from, uh, from the phase boundaries. So the density of, of points near the phase boundaries becomes very low as compared to the density of points uh, deep inside the phases. Now, computationally, uh, what's happening here is very clear. The network knows that near these phase boundaries, there is a very high degree of uncertainty, right? So the gap is very small. So the Chern number is not, the topological invariant is not uh, always well defined. So it wants to run away from the points where it's having a hard time determining the topological invariant. And physically what's happening here, uh, you know, and this is really the interpretation if you want to think of it, uh, in the language of RG is that this is uh, flowing away from the, uh, from the critical, from the critical uh, uh, lines, okay? Now, one more game we can play is ask about, you know, what this RG transformation uh, is doing to simple systems. So let, what, let's do something simple. Let's take uh, a clean lattice, a clean eight by eight lattice, and put a single impurity. So at, at some point in this, uh, in this lattice, I'm gonna change my chemical potential to be slightly different than the rest of the lattice. Uh, so when, when I start with delta mu, which is this impurity equals zero, then a clean lattice becomes a clean lattice, right? Nothing happens. Now, when I start ramping up this, uh, this delta mu, you see that something appears. So uh, some, some variation in the chemical potential and also in T minus and Delta appears uh, near the point that is, you know, spatially close to where the impurity uh, was in the eight by eight. And then when I further increase my chemical, my, uh, my impurity, it becomes more and more pronounced. So from this, we can learn uh, basically two things. One is that um, local perturbations remain local. So this RG transformation seems to be local. And this is a confusing point. It's preserving a global property, which is the chair number, but it works in a local way. It works between spatially adjacent sites. And the, th and the second thing is that this transformation also seems to be local in, in channel space, in parameter space, right? Because it, it does change, also, it changes mu, it also changes T minus and delta. But if you look at the scale of the axis here, the variation in the chemical potential is, is much, much more than that in the, uh, in the other parameters. So we have a transformation which is local in real space, but also in parameter space. And that's, more or less everything I wanted to uh, to tell you about this. Now, just a quick quick wrap up of, of what we did. So we have shown that neural networks are able to, to calculate topological invariants of uh, large disordered systems, even larger to those they have been trained on. So this is the this is the novelty here. So we are using the network on on a kind of input it's actually never seen before. And using this RG-like structure of downsizing a large problem into a smaller problem, we can understand a bit of uh, the inner workings or how this, this uh, black box is operating. And yeah, that's all. Okay, thank you so much, Amri. This was lovely. Um, let's uh, wait to see if uh, people have questions. Okay, thank you for uh, the nice, very interesting talk. Um, I want to understand a few things. Um, so when you presented the, the convolution part of the network, um, and so you, so convolution is kind of multiplying, like a, you put a matrix on a, an area and you transform that and you decrease that. But then you have many, many convolutions. So you produce many copies 
of the same uh, image and, so, and something. So what you did after, did you go back and take one of these convolution and being like full of ones? And oh, is that okay. what yeah. you, uh, that was the intent? Yeah, that's a good question. So let me uh, go back to this slide if, uh, if I'm able to. <laughs> uh, okay, just a second. So you're right, we do have many copies here. We have many yes. copies and then you, know, you, you operate on them again and you have even more copies and so on. So you have to end up with some layer which unites them. Um, it's called a pooling layer, which it can act in several ways. It can take an average between the different copies. It can take you know, the largest one. There are several ways to, uh, to attack this, but you have to somehow unite them. So is that, but so where did you put your, your averages convolution? You, you put it as one of these copies or where is it like here? Do you mean the, the initialization? Yes. Oh, no, no. So this is, uh, you mean this, this operation? Right, that one. No, so, so what we did actually was we trained the entire network, including all of these, these many layers of convolution to do just, just this simple operation. So the entire network in the beginning only does this operation. Uh, and it's like every layer does a little bit of this operation. So that's not one of the convolution, that's no. all of them? No. Yeah, no, that's, that's all of them. That's all of them. And then you start uh, fixing that, you start correcting that by training further on the churn number. So how do they differentiate these? So you start with the same initialization, all the convolution does the same initialization or, or and then you, you differentiate that afterwards or? No, no, so, so the way we practically do it is we initialize them to be completely random. Okay. And then instead we, we have an extra training stage where we don't train on chair number. We train where the input is the, the original lattice and the output is the average lattice and okay. the network is just trying to to give you the average lattice oh. you know, through all the layers yeah okay thank you sure mm -hmm. yes uh, so yeah well thank you very much very much for the presentation it, it was really interesting um i also have a question regarding the the convolution layers so I, i'm really not an expert in machine learning but as far as i understand these convolution, uh, this, these convolution layers in your case reflect somehow the fact that you have translational asymmetry in, in your lattice. But you don't really have it because you have disorder. And, and my question was, does this disorder and, and for example, the type of disorder that you use, the correlation length of your disorder, does that impose some restriction on how you define these layers? And if so, does it really impact the way you, you, you have to train the layer, the, 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 the network in the end? Okay, thanks for, it's a good question. So thanks for, uh, for raising this point. So I just wanna, uh, uh, you know, be precise. We're not really using the fact that there is translational invariance because like you're saying, there is none. Uh, these networks are usually used on images where of course you don't have translation invariance, uh, the underlying assumption is that nearby sites have something to do with each other more than faraway sites. Um, and this, you know, this still holds even if you have disorder in our case, right? Because um, we expect if you, if you think of the original way uh, chair numbers are being calculated, you scan your Brillo and zone and you collect patches of local objects. So yeah, but, but the, the chain number is a global object, and, and, and so it, it, it's the result of a, of a, a large right, number exactly. of Exactly, so it's, a, it's the result of, of summing, you know, local objects. So what we do here is the same, we're summing local objects, and we're getting this global property. But local in real space or local in case space? So, yeah, right. So... We, they're one in the same because because um, you know we don't have case space, um, but the fact that we have 
So you should actually remember that there are two stages here. Let me go back here. So the fact that this is a local, this one is a local transformation does not mean you're picking up, you know, uh, patches of real space local objects because you are then feeding it into this network. This network does not even do chair numbers. This no, one does chair numbers and it operates on all the sites. So, yeah, so, so this one is, is non local. I mean, you can, it's also convolutional, but it, it, uh, it works on a very small lattice. So, if it's convolutional and the kernel is large enough, then you're, co you're generating all correlations between all uh, scales. And, and, uh, and how do you extract the churn number to train this, the, the, the network eventually in the, in the lattice? Uh, how do you calculate the, the, the quantity? Because you don't have access to the Brie Moisson. So, how do you calculate this number? To, oh, to calculate so, the distance, the, the geometric distance. Yeah, so so there are um, one or two real space algorithms, which are the main one is called, you know, is using what's called the bot index. So okay, um, it's it's using some sort of an inverse Fourier transform, if you want, okay, okay. Um, and it's calculating these Wilson loops in the in the inverted. Um, okay, okay, okay. Uh, space. Well, uh, well, thank you, thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm sorry. I have a trivial, really trivial question. You may have said it, uh, yeah, about the precisely that slide. So what you're giving the network is not uh, energy dispersions or anything. It's just parameters of the Hamiltonian. Right. Exactly. Okay. So uh, uh, okay. So so this it's defined for a class of Hamiltonian. If you want to do it for some other. Hamiltonian, you have to restart from scratch, right? Yes, you're just right. We're we're just assuming, you know, it's a square lattice with spinless fermions, right? It's limited to in this in this sense. Yes. So, uh, yeah, so. Okay. So so would there be a way to des design it in such a way that uh, the, you would start instead from the from uh, the energy spectrum, and that would make it more general, or it doesn't make sense to ask it that way? Or? It's it's a good question. The question is, how do you add this order on top of that energy spectrum? Um, right. There are you, other... <laughs> yeah, you would need to diagonalize it, which is defeating the purpose, right? <laughs> exactly. So there are other, other approaches, not exactly about topology, but other approaches, which use the Green's function as the input, so that's maybe a bit closer to what you're saying, but you're still, you still have to assume some matrix structure of the Green's function if you want to input it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah. you. Yes, I have a question. Um, I just missed maybe how does this depend on the strength of disorder? What type yeah. of quantity? Um, I didn't say so. I didn't miss. Uh, yeah. um, yeah, so we chose the disorder strength to be such that, uh, let me see if I can find a quick, yeah, so we chose the disorder strength such that these phase diagrams, which are just, you know, a visual representation of the disorder, are different enough from the clean case so that we have an effect, but not large enough so that this becomes, you know, complete, a complete mess, you know, confetti. Yeah. So, uh, it's it's kind of an ad hoc kind of calculation, but we also we always have this upper limit of you know we don't want to be larger than the basic uh, uh, energy scale of our of our Hamiltonian. Right. Yes, because you could conceive that if this order is strong enough, you might have a local you know tweak that would that would change the topology locally and you lose it in this uh, RG scheme. Right? Right. So right, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, if we have strong enough disorder, we can have one patch of the system which has, you know, turn number one and the other one, which is turn number zero, uh, minus one, and they would, you know, they would sum up to zero, uh, but we would just see the zero. We, won't, we wouldn't see. Uh... Cool. Uh, thanks for the really nice talk. Um, I had one question about the training of the RG layer. Um, so I think you mentioned that uh, uh, you train it to minimize the difference between an exactly calculated input uh, turn number for the 16 by 16 or for the no. 8 by 8 layer. 
and then you compare that against the exact result, or sorry, the up against the learned result for the four by four. Is that right? Uh, so what we we only train on on eight by eight, right? But what we benchmark against exactly calculated sixteen by sixteen. I see. But so, but I, if I remember right, when you train the eight the reduction layer to go from eight by eight to four by four, um, the what you're, I guess, what you're, you want to preserve the churn number, and you measure that by looking at the output of the initially trained classifier layer. Is that correct? Precisely. Yeah. So yeah, you're 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 sitting you're you're here, and right. so you have your eight by eight. This one makes it a four by four, and then you have your base, and you compare what's here to what's been calculated here. Yeah. Right. So so do you think you would recover some of the? You you show that there's this small drop off in accuracy when you go to the the larger networks. Do you think that you would recover some of that if you if you trained the RG network using an exact calculation of the churn number for the four by four layer or for the four by four uh, lattice? Oh, you mean replacing this network yeah. for yeah? So this is this this question always uh, always arises. So why why do I even have to to put a network here? Um, and this the, the answer is actually uh, uh, disappointingly technical. So when we do this back propagation, uh, the network does not, the training does not work well if you have a black box here instead of a neural network. Um, it, it just makes everything painfully slow, like 10 times slower, we tried it. Um, and you have to have, it's, it's better to have a network here. So this network is, is extremely, extremely uh, uh, accurate. I don't think replacing it would, um, would really improve the accuracy. Um, and you know, the trade-off of training time versus uh, your gain would be very unfavorable in this situation. I see, okay, thank you very much. Okay, so I think uh, there are no more questions unless somebody wants in the last minute. And we're almost uh, on time, a little bit over time. And so thank you again, Omri, for uh, visiting us uh, virtually and for giving us a nice talk and Thank you. hopefully we'll see you uh, in person someday soon hopefully yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you everyone bye, -bye. thank you bye